Actually, um, depending on when you're coming, we may even be able to do something with McGill because they have a conference in July. They might want to have you there to do something for their conference. Uh, yeah. I, I I'll touch base with you. There's quite a bit of flexibility. The uh, retreat uh, next summer, I think, is the um, something like the 10th to the 17th. So it could be either the week before the 10th or the week after the 17th. And there's quite a bit of flexibility there because I do want to have a nice visit. <clears throat> yeah, we want to spend some time under the under the stars with you. And the noise, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping Adirondack happens at a good time for me to come this year. Uh, it was nice to come just for like to just to see the location, but I want to come and spend at least a night there. Oh, I think that's a good idea. I believe it's the 10th to the 17th, but I'm not sure. It's actually a good time of year for the Perseids this time around, so. I think so, yeah. We've got a very low moon. That's going to be nice. Mm. Oh, you're well ahead. I hadn't looked yet. Mm. But we, we talked about it on Tuesday during the Global Star Party. Yeah. I guess I missed that because I didn't change <laughs> You know, That's for the it. first Stop time, permanently mute you now. <laughs> for the first time, I think it was two years ago, the meteor shower in uh, December. Is it the Geminids? Geminids, yep. Geminids. yeah. I saw that for the first time because I wasn't home. I was someplace else where it was a little bit warmer, and I was amazed at that shower. That is something else to watch. Mm -hmm. It is. The sky is so crisp in the winter time. Oh, man. And the meteors were just incredible. I mean, I, w I was shocked. I, I mean, I wish it was a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. Usually, honestly, it's cloudy here. I mean, it's a time of year where it's mostly cloudy, you know, here. And uh, it, I had crystal clear skies where I was at, and it was beautiful. Well, there's Facebook user on Facebook saying, hi, Kareem and Scott. <laughs> hi, Facebook, hi, Facebook user. user. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who Facebook user is. Genevieve? They all identify themselves. Oh, it's Chris Larson. Ah, hi, Chris. Chris makes me laugh on Facebook. I enjoy it. <laughs> it's always about, oh, Chris, I have coffee. I went up and got some before we started. <laughs> I have a cup of coffee as well, a little mug, a whole mug. And I got my coffee too. Well, I really just drank all of my guys' Pepsi. <laughs> all right. We're all caffeinated. Oh, yeah. Launching in 2029, the Da Vinci Mission, named after Leonardo da Vinci, is designed to address fundamental questions about the origin, evolution, and composition of Venus. During two gravity assist flybys, da Vinci will study the cloud tops in ultraviolet light, tracking cloud patterns as they change with time and analyzing signatures of mysterious chemicals that absorb ultraviolet light. Both flybys will also examine heat emanating from the Venus surface on the planet's night side. We will look for geological clues of this planet's mysterious past to paint a global picture of surface composition and the evolution of the planet's ancient highlands. Seven months after our second flyby, Da Vinci will release its atmospheric descent probe. The spacecraft will watch its probe enter Venus's atmosphere over the course of two days. The probe will take about an hour to fall through the atmosphere, taking measurements and snapping images down to the surface. These measurements include profiles of composition, winds, temperature, pressure, and acceleration. Key gases will be measured to help us understand how Venus formed and evolved. Some of these measurements may reveal chemical signatures of ancient water. 
With our suite of measurements, DaVinci will provide new insights into Venus's atmosphere's complex composition, structure, and chemistry. As the probe nears the surface, its descent camera will capture breathtaking bird's eye views of the mysterious terrain known as the Alpha Regio Tessera, possibly revealing evidence in the rocks that water once flowed across the Venusian surface. These up-close images of the surface will provide new insights into geologic processes and will help us to understand what it might be like to stand on the Venus surface. An oxygen sensing student collaboration experiment will shed light on the role of this gas in the Venus atmosphere. The discoveries that emerge from this diverse data set will tell us whether Venus was truly habitable and the story we reveal at Venus will reach even beyond the solar system to analog exoplanets that will be observed with the James Webb Space Telescope. Venus is waiting for us all, and da Vinci is ready to take us there and ignite a new Venus Renaissance. Hello everybody, it's Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. Welcome to the 25th Astronomical League Live program. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it, every one of these programs has been put together by Terry Mann, uh, the Astronomical League. She brings on uh, many of the other members of the executive staff, and she always brings on a fantastic speaker. I'm gonna turn it over to her and let her make the introductions. Thank you, Scott. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, and hopefully everybody's got clear skies. John Goss is here. He is going to update us a little bit on the comet. We've got Carol Orge here, which is the president of the league. And David Levy doesn't get much better than David Levy. We have him here tonight. And Kareem Jaffer, we are really honored to have Kareem here. It's the first time on the show, and I am really looking forward to his talk. And as always, we thank Scott for being there for broadcasting this for us. So how about if we go back to David Levy? David, how is Arizona tonight? Arizona is partly cloudy and very windy. In fact, I went outside and I was blown right over. And I fell on top of a cactus. <laughs> And I'm growing, I'm growing branches. Anyway, other than that, it's it's cold and windy, and uh, um, it's supposed to get colder and less windier. Anyway, yeah. I do have a quotation today. It's from uh, Ralph Hodgson, the Song of Honor, and I'm going to be doing this fairly frequently because this was Wendy's favorite favorite quote, and I believe that once we were on both on one of these programs, when I finished the talk, the lecture I was giving, and he came to the microphone and we both said this quote together. So it is her favorite. I want to tell you that I just went to the cemetery yesterday and I visited Wendy's gravesite and uh, we had a little talk, I brought her up to date. She's worried that I'm not eating enough and, uh, and so that's, I'm just trying to do the best that I can. I did tell her that I put all the speakers that she didn't like back up and she got a good laugh over that. And they're all loudspeakers all over the property now. And we're laughing about that. She says, just keep them a little bit tidy for you. Anyway, here is the quotation from the Song of Honor in honor of Wendy. I stood and stared, the sky was lit. The sky was stars all over it. I stood, I knew not why. Without a wish, without a will, I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars. And still I stared into the sky. Thank you, Terry, and back to you. Thank you, David. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about how many of us can relate to that. You know, how many of us have stood out under the stars thinking the same thing and just standing there in awe because of where we're at and the stars we're looking at. 
So thank you, David. That really does hit a chord, I imagine, with most of us that are viewing this right now. So thank, thank you. you very much. I appreciate that. And with that, let's see. Let's go to Carol Orge. How about what's going on in the league, Carol? Any updates you can give us? Well, we've got uh, good news coming out of Baton Rouge. They're coming along nicely with the website. And our goal is by the end of the month, we will open up registration. But give us a little leeway, maybe till mid-March, but it, it's coming. Uh, they've got a wonderful convention plan, including our own David uh, Levy, who will be one of our speakers, special speakers there. And he will be also having a book signing uh, during part of the convention as well. Uh, other notables are Dave Eichert and uh, uh, Mr. Eclipse. Uh, Fred Espinak will also be there. Hmm. And they've got some wonderful activities planned on the side. And uh, it's coming coming along nicely. Uh, and I get back to what David was just saying about uh, his poetry and uh, alluding to being out of the night nice skies. And why we forget that so often, the peace and tranquility that's out there under the, the stars. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. always if we're having perfect stars, uh, perfect skies or not, which we don't often have here in the Midwest, like David has in Arizona most of the time. But uh, it's just the idea of getting away and just getting away from our responsibilities and just enjoying nature and the magic above us. Uh, I don't have anything further right now. Terry, uh, back to you. Okay, thank you, Carol. Yeah, I think of our Alcon conferences, how many times we've all stood outside. Uh, Bryce Canyon was one of the big ones, uh, and we'll be doing that again in 2025. So we are all looking forward. And even like you said, Baton Rouge, we could probably go out by the river and still see a few stars maybe from yeah. downtown there. So and I mean, it's what we do. Observatory, uh, that's, that's, uh, that is set up very nicely. There's going to be a field trip there. Uh, the county uh, sets up and operates that observatory. So it should be a good experience. Oh, as really? Well. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll be nice to see what kind of trips they have set up. I haven't really seen a whole lot there yet. So I'm looking forward to the website coming online. And so, they have told me I have to try the gumbo, even though it's <laughs> maybe an off season a little bit. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a good no. old person. <laughs> I, well, well, actually, like sure when I'm, I was down there about six months ago. Uh, God is warning you, don't, don't go there. <laughs> right. that, that kind of forced it on me when I was visiting and scouting it out about six months ago. And yeah, mm. I, I took the samples and it was, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that will enjoy that. So, all right. John, I hope you are geared up and ready to go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, pretty pretty oh. much. Um, okay. th th thank you for having me on. Uh, before I start, I must say I'm a, I'm a little intimidated because I'm going to be talking something or other about comets, and yet we have David Levy right there who <laughs> who without preparing anything could, could could talk way over my head in an instant. So I, I was thinking about what, 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 what to say. Now, when Terry spoke to me uh, earlier about this, about what I should do, I, I made a, a lame joke about the comet uh, conspiracy theory, latest comet conspiracy theory being uh, related to some big balloon floating across the United States. Now, I admit it was a little bit of a lame joke, but it got me to, act, to, to, to thinking about all this. And I thought, well, one approach to this talk would be my own experience with comets and my uh, the public's experience with comets and my experience with the public <laughs> with comets. Uh, so I, I thought that's the way I, I would I would approach all this. Um, right, right, right before I start here, I'm just about ready. I'd like to say that there are two things that I think that the public reacts very favorably towards uh, celestial events. First one would be total solar eclipses which is quite understandable because uh, it's, I will say it's guaranteed that a total solar eclipse is going to be fantastic uh, if it's clear. If it's not clear, well, you're sunk. But if it's clear, it's going to be fantastic. And the other celestial um, subject would be comets, which is a little bit less clear to me because I think of all the people here, you will agree that most comets end up to be uh, less than satisfactory. You know, they're duds, they fizzle. But once in a while, you have one come chugging along that 
um, exceeds your expectations, and that really amazes yourself and and the the, the public. Um, I can think of uh, the latest one, at least for me, that was kind of like that would be Comet Neowise almost three years ago. It was summer of 2020. Uh, it wasn't a great comet, but it was it was good enough. And probably the one before that would be Hale Bob, which was how many years ago? It, it was it was it 30 years ago? It, it, you know, 25 years ago. You know, we are due for a fantastic comet to come chugging along our part of the solar system. So anyway, let's get started. Um, see what damage I can do here. Okie dokie. So what's what's up with this comment anyway? I um, I was a little late coming on the broadcast tonight simply because I was outside trying to get a, a view of the comet through a pair of binoculars. It was just getting dark enough, and it has just cleared off the first time it's been like that in more than a week. So I hadn't had a chance to look at it, but I got out there and I thought, oh, yep, there it is, right, right where it should be. So I can guarantee you that if you can see this comet, if you make the effort to see it tonight, it'll be there. It hasn't disintegrated. It, it's uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that in just in just a moment. So it's a media favorite right now, uh, comet ZTF, um, and I'll be discussing a little bit more about its name and its uh, particulars. So the media lo loves comets. Um, let me go back. I was going to start out with Comet Kohotek back in 1973-74, because that was one of the first ones I saw, and I was at college, and I was one of the, I, I had a little telescope with me, and I, and I could see it, and I impressed my friends that way, but it really, uh, it was, it was it's kind of been known to be a, a real dud, and a, that's what how people view, when they think of something that's a dud, they think of Comet Kohotek. But let me talk about Comet Ison in 2013. Now, Carol Orridge is president of the league. And as president, he may receive now and then an interesting phone call. Well, back in 2013, I was vice president and I received an interesting phone call about Comet Ison. Person on the other end um, seemed to kind of know what was going on, but she was saying that she had heard that Comet Ison was going to collide with the earth or come very close and, you know, all this stuff. Well, you know, what did I have to say? So I talked to her for a little bit about it. And I finally asked her where she was calling from. And she said uh, she was in Bolivia in a, in a hotel. And I could hear in the background, you know, hotel lounge noises. So I kind of believe what, what she was saying, but, you know, she was kind of, really concerned about this thing. So I tried to put her mind at ease about this comment and so on. But it, it can, and after, after we hung up, I started thinking, you know, people really have the wrong idea about comments, what, what, what they hear in the media, what they hear from uh, other people. I'll look at that in just a moment um, about comments. You know, it's, it's all, all kind of strange stuff. You know, we, uh, I think everyone here will agree with me when I read what's on this page, that, uh, that we, we live in a time in which we have really easy access to science information, as well as information about anything. You know, as, as I said right here, you know, if you need to know anything about anything, uh, all that information is easy to find, and it's quite literally at your fingertips. So we live in an, an amazing age. But on the other hand, we also live in a time in which facts are often ignored, the truth is disregarded, and science is doubted. You know, that's incredible for us to believe that science is doubted. We have some groups of people who stubbornly cling to what is forcefully and repeatedly stated by others who are not truthful nor particularly knowledgeable about a topic. It is a place where provocateurs and demagogues are held in high esteem, loudly commanding attention while uttering complete nonsense and falsehoods. I'm um, not going to get into any more about that, but my, my point is, is that we have a lot of noise out there saying different things. A lot of it is completely incorrect. And 
this may affect our perception of science, of the universe, of the world around us, perhaps comets itself. They go, oh, oh, what am I talking about? Okay, well, let's look back 1997. I think uh, a lot of people have heard of this. The Heaven's Gate cult believed that there was an alien spaceship uh, following uh, Comet hale Bob. And these uh, the aliens of this spaceship were going to transport the true believers onto the ship into a, a great, great land, great life, some other world. Well, what really happened is that it ended up with this, with the cult. 32 members of them uh, took their own lives. All because of this comet. All because people didn't really understand what a comet was, and they believed what demagogues and provocateurs would say, unfortunately. Oh, that, that won't happen again. Well, okay, let's look at 2012. This didn't have a tragic ending. In fact, it generally... Uh, in my camp, it received a lot of belly laughs, but there were a lot of um, statements being talked about the Mayan calendar and how the end of the world was coming in December of 2012, simply because the Mayan calendar ended one of its uh, long counting cycles, which I guess it's akin to saying something like uh, the end of the month, even though this is a many, many hundred, hundred year cycle, by the end of the month, that's the end of the world not realizing that the calendar would just flip over and the first day of a new month would be again, first day of a new counting cycle would be again. Well, some people thought that uh, strange things were gonna happen to the earth, uh, weird stuff about Milky Way, aligning uh, with the Milky Way, uh, solar problems. But one of the explanations or one of the, the, the fears was a large body, possibly a comet, would approach the earth, maybe hit the earth, but approach the earth, come too close, wreaking havoc on our planet. Now, you can kind of see why I, I said I, I got a few belly laughs because this is completely nonsense. No credible person would ever say anything like this. There was absolutely no evidence backing it up, but there were people who, who believed it. So what's people believe the strangest things. So, okay, I'm kind of getting extreme here. Thinking, well, you know, these are extreme cases. Yeah, fortunately they are. But uh, we also live in a world in which our common everyday media likes to emphasize something to make sure it, we, it catches our attention, to make sure that, that, that we listen to whatever they have to say. Such is the case with this comment, I think. Um, a month and a half ago, when I first started hearing about it, this is what appeared in, in the news. First appearance in 50,000 years. Okay, well, that's, that's true. You know, kind of interesting. A green comet. Uh, well, yeah, but I think you all realize that a green color in the heavens is really kind of unusual and you have to have special circumstances to be able to, to see it. Uh, and the media neglected to emphasize that the bright moonlight in late January and early February would prohibit really any, any good visual viewing of this thing. Right now, the moon is, in, is, uh, is below the horizon for most of the evening uh, until after midnight, I think. So it, it, this is a good time to try to spot it, which I tried to do just before this uh, event started tonight, and I was successful. Talk about that in a moment. And I, on one media site, I saw the statement that without a telescope, the comet will most likely look like a faint greenish smudge in the sky. Well, no. No, really? <laughs> Let's take a look, uh, a more factual look at what's, what's going on. Uh, thanks to Guy Otwell. He gave me a permission to use this from his blog. It's a um, plot of the path of the comet, ZTF, which is the, uh, how do you say that, uh, Zwicky Transient Facility, which is on top of Mount Palomar outside of San Diego, uh, which studies the night sky, uh, sh shooting images of the entire night sky every every couple nights. And it tries to see what changes in the sky are, is, is happening. And it'll pick up comets and, and uh um, um, Nova and uh, um, variable stars, wood things in the sky. So ZTF came closest to the sun on, on January 12th. Okay. Uh, but remember on January 12th, the moon really wasn't positioned well for us. So it, we had a lot of nagging moonlight unless you wanted to be up at, at 3 a.m. Uh, closest to the earth was uh, last week at 26 million miles. 
So it's um, nowhere near the earth, no, nowhere a danger as far as collision goes. But tonight, uh, it, as the comet comes descending down through the plane of the solar system, excuse me, tonight, it, ha it happens to be closest to the planet Mars or closest to the planet, to the direction of, the, of planet Mars in the sky. So it appears fairly close to it, which is why you can easily find it uh, using a pair of binoculars uh, just by looking at Mars. Uh, the comet will be to the upper right of the upper left of it. So that's to the northeast of Mars uh, by less than one binocular field of view. So you should be able to see it if it's dark enough and if it's uh, clear enough for you. And over the next few nights, it gets, uh, it, it'll pass Mars tonight and uh, be down to uh, a little bit more further away from it tomorrow night. But on the uh, 14th, on, on the, uh, what is the 14th? Valentine's night. Uh, comet will be right next to Aldebaran on Valentine's night, star Aldebaran. This is sort of the, the, the path that it's, it's coming through the sky now. As you can see in the upper part of the graph or the chart, there's the planet Mars. And the red line going across is the path of the ecliptic, okay? Which is what is passing tonight, or excuse me, it'll pass uh, on the 12th. And then it'll come down past uh, Aldebaran and the Hyades. And then it gets farther and farther away, uh, both from Earth and the sun meaning that it's going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. I have a friend in uh, New Mexico who saw it the other night uh, on the, oops, sorry, I already said what this was. I have a, a friend in New Mexico who saw it the other night, and he, uh, on February 8th, and he, he, he caught a hold of it uh, through a six-inch F5 ref reflector at about 65 power. That, that, yes, he could see it, that no, it's not naked eye, no, it's not green, uh, but it is kind of how you would picture a comet like this to be. It would be a round, fuzzy, hazy smudge with a faint tail jutting away from the direction of the sun. One thing that I, I think that's really fascinating about this comet is that it is moving through our area of the solar system very rapidly. I mean, very rapidly. So you look at it uh, through a, a telescope or a pair of binoculars. Uh, if, when you do that, try to know, note exactly where it is with relation to the stars around it. Because an hour later, it'll move about seven arc minutes, which is about a fourth the diameter, of the, the apparent diameter of the moon. So you'll be able to, to see it change spot. I don't know if you'll be able to actually see it move as the seconds pass, but certainly as every, after every five minutes, you may be able to see, a, yeah, yeah, I could tell that it, it has moved. Because tomorrow night, it, it'll be... Uh, another two two degrees or so away from where it is tonight, and same with the following night after that. So this is one one fascinating thing of, of, about the comet. Now, after tonight, not right now, but after tonight, when Kareem is done talking, is he's going to talk about some citizen science stuff, and maybe some of this stuff I've been saying will be offset by him, and he'll be talking about what 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 a lot of science out there is for citizens to try to participate in and understand, but. After all this is over tonight, go out and see if it is clear. Take your pair of binoculars, look for Mars, and um, see if see if you can see it tonight. Um, I can go back here. This chart is on the League Facebook page, and I'm really pleased to say that it is one of the most visited, viewed um, posts that, that that we've had a long time. Uh, four times the amount that, that we normally see. So I'm pretty happy with that. And I, I hope a lot of people will get out there tonight, tomorrow night, the next night, and so on, and try to catch, catch it before it goes away. Because as we said at the beginning, it's 50,000 years, so you're never going to see it again. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you got the idea, if you're going to see some green streak across the sky, no. <clears throat> but you will still be able to see a, a, a grayish, brightish gray smudge uh, next to Mars tonight, and on the 14th, it'll be right next to the bright star Aldebaran. Um, I better be, I better stop here because I think I'll start uh, lecturing or something, which I, sh I shouldn't do. But I, I want to th uh, thank you all for listening to that. And I really encourage everyone to get out and try to see what they, they can see in the sky every night with, 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 with what you can see. It's, it's pretty cool, I think. Okay, um, so Terry? Thank you, John. Um, what will it be near Mars, like for the whole weekend? Will it be fairly close, or will it be moving sort of. on past? Uh, well, tonight it'll be right next to Mars. Tomorrow night it'll be also, 
it'll be kind of on the other side of the field of view of your, of your pair of binoculars. But then the next night after that, it moves out of that field of view. But if you can, if you find Mars, you'll be able to find Aldebaran and it moves right next to it, just, just, just like it did Mars. So okay. as I was saying on uh, Valentine's night, it'll be as closest to Aldebaran, uh, not in three-dimensional space, but in our two-minute, two-dimensional projection of it. Aldebaran's many light years away, while Mars is something like, I'm uh, not Mars, uh, the comet will be uh, 40 million miles, something like that. I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's interesting to see. Okay. It's heading south, right? Kind um, of south? It's heading south in the sky. Nothing to worry about yeah. on Earth, though. It's not heading south on Earth. Right, but, yeah, right. In, in uh, that's sky. what I mean. It's heading. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but as it's doing so, it's moving away both from the sun and Earth. So yeah. it's becoming dimmer. Now is over the next few nights, that will be your best chance to see it. But don't, well, but don't worry. Comets come and comets go. There'll be more comets coming. That's true. So <laughs> by the time it really gets in, can the Southern Hemisphere see that? They, I know we're favored right now. Yeah. I wonder. Um, yeah, yeah. I think the, the declination of it is around 20, 20 north. So people in the okay. Southern Hemisphere who yeah. are above 70 South can see it. Yeah. So yeah, okay. our friends in, in Chile and Australia, and they'll be able to see it. Okay. Well, that sounds good to me. All right, John. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you for putting up with all that. <laughs> hey, no problem. Anytime. You're welcome anytime. So, all right. Um, let's see. We're going to go ahead and move to Kareem. If you, I'm sure you're probably already ready. I'm and ready. I would. <laughs> Many people already know who Kareem is. We, I mean, he's Global Star Party. This is the first time we are honored to have him here, and he'll probably, hopefully, be back another time. But for right now, I would like to introduce Professor Kareem Jaffer. Um, he is doing a talk, as we've been saying, on students with citizen science, and he's, he has been interested in, in the astronomical community uh, doing public events court and coordinator for the RASC Montreal Center since 2016, helping reestablish the IK Williamson Astronomy Library and coordinating both public events and outreach activities throughout the Montreal area, cultivating partnerships with many local and global institutions. Over the past few years, Kareem has been actively learning and sharing the two-eyed seeing perspective through presentations and outreach activities with indigenous peoples and astronomy communities across the globe. As a frequent presenter on the Global Star Party and uh, Explore Scientific Alliance Ambassador, Kareem was also part of Starmus Star Party Outreach Team this past September in Armenia. In addition to mentoring several student astronomy clubs and coordinating visits to local schools, guides, scouts, and library, Kareem is a member of the National Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Public Educational Outre and Public Outreach Committee and the 2021 recipient of the Charles M. Good Award. Boy, Kareem, you are busy. <laughs> you have been very um, active. Thanks, Terry. Thank I, it always it always flusters me to hear all that out loud. <laughs> I know. I I yes, but very proud of it. Um, you are a mover and a shaker. I have no doubt. So thank, thank you for taking the time to appear on here tonight, and I will turn this over to you. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I, I remember very fondly uh, being part of Alcon when it was virtual in all the way back in 2021. And uh, I mean, I've been now with Scott on the Global Star Parties for a couple of years. Uh, I think I'm, well, I know I'm over 50 in terms of the number that I've been on. Um, not anywhere close to David or Scott, but uh, trying to trying to keep up the rear there in terms of appearances. <laughs> So what I want to plan to share with you tonight is a little bit about the approach that I take both within the class that I teach at John Abbott College 
and in some of the outreach that we do here in the Montreal Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. A lot of this involves bringing both students as well as youth of all ages into the realm of astronomy at a place where they want to come on board. And this is kind of key. Different approaches work for different people. It depends on where they want to go, what direction they want to go, uh, what they plan for their career, and how big a role they think astronomy might be for them. And here in this picture, I have several of my former students, uh, fantastic kids who are now young adults, and some of them have already finished their studies. Some of them are in grad school. Some of them are running observatories at universities to help out with outreach. And I love seeing that. I love seeing them continue to give back because that was one of the big parts of what I tried to bring into John Abbott College is this idea of outreach, of sharing what you do. Now, by doing citizen science and bringing real astronomical data and the ability to really kind of start to start to produce, start to participate, start to be part of research, we were doing something very different for a college level course. And so here I have a couple of quotes from students from the past years about the idea that this was an enriching experience and something profoundly new for them, something that they hadn't gotten in any other class in the past. Now I'm gonna point out from the start that uh, when I give any of these outreach talks, I very much want to give an acknowledgement, not just of the fact that we are on unceded lands from the First Nations, but also that we share the sky with the peoples from across the world. So when we look up at the sky, we're not just looking at a moon that's shared and that has names that correspond to observations of nature from across the world, but we're looking at stars that have different stories depending on where you grew up and what culture you grew up in. So Wintermaker, which is the Ojibwe version of everything from Orion all the way to Aldebaran, all the way out to Procyon, is currently dominant in the southern sky. And it keeps us through the night in the recognition that we are in wintertime. And it was wonderful to hear John talk about using Aldebaran as our marker for the comet over the next few days, because I've been using Capella as the marker in Auriga for the last week. And so now I'm going to shift my vision over towards Aldebaran and watch as the comet passes by the hole in the sky, the Pleiades, the seven sisters, the seven virgins, the seven boys. However you respect the stories of the stars, it makes you aware of what's happening in the world around you at that time. Now, much of what I'm gonna talk about here could not be possible if not for the partnership that we have between John Abbott College and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Montreal Center. Our students are welcomed in and that allows us not just to have the exposure to amateur and even some professional astrophotographers, but also access to equipment to data that maybe we can't take ourselves. Because here in Montreal, we have kind of this perpetual Montreal nebula, which gives us very few good observing nights. So in order to do real astronomy and real science, you need other ways to get to the data. Now, John mentioned briefly the idea of, you know, maybe I'll talk about something with citizen science to do with comet observations. And there are citizen science projects to observe comets, to observe asteroids, to look for minor planets. A lot of those require equipment that young people don't have access to readily. So what I want to highlight for you is the way in which I bring citizen science into the classroom, as well as into some of our outreach talks, so that you can see where we are able to connect it without any expense to the students. And even when the students can't afford at night to go out themselves uh, to an observing area, to a dark sky, they still benefit from a lot of what the club enables us to do. This partnership has really blossomed for the club. It gives us this vibrance because we have these students come, but also because we have science being shared during our outreach events. Uh, Julian, who's in the center here with me, uh, as well as Sabrina, we were together doing observations with the public using the SA100 filter from our spec to show the spectra of stars and explain how stars work, what the spectra are, what type of chemical signatures you can see. So taking 
the science that they were doing in the chemistry classroom, in the physics classroom, and in astronomy, and bringing it out to the public to share with all ages, all backgrounds. And Julian really kind of pioneered this. And at our 2019 General Assembly in Toronto, Julian gave a talk about the idea that we shouldn't be scared of bringing science into our talks and into our outreach. And it really resonated with a lot of the RASC members. Now, when I have students come into my classroom or when I go out, uh, last week I was out at a local school that's both an elementary and a high school, I have kids coming from all different backgrounds. And so one of the things that I like talking to them about before the event even starts is what do you want to be when you grow up? Why are you interested in space and where do you see it? And you know, a lot of the kids when they're in elementary school or when they're watching TV shows or watching movies or reading books growing up, they think to themselves that I want to be an astronaut. And back in the 70s and 80s, as the space exploration kind of went through the moon phase and then started into the space shuttle phase, a lot of the background of different students and different youth who wanted to go into space exploration didn't match the people that they saw. These days, there's much more inclusiveness in terms of the astronauts that are being chosen, both by NASA, the European Space Agency, and a lot of international collaborations are bringing these stories of individuals from different and diverse backgrounds. We have a First Nations uh, indigenous astronaut up at the International Space Station, and this resonates with a lot of kids and they realize that this is a possible path for them. But in school, when you start to learn about what's involved in becoming an astronaut and how few people are chosen, a lot of students, you know, kind of shy away from that, or maybe that wasn't for them or they can't pass the health requirements or the, the mobility requirements. And so a lot of them talk about, you know, well, I want to be a rocket scientist, you know, uh, it's not rocket science, it's easy. If it is rocket science, maybe it's hard. Maybe you've got all these different equations that you have to work through, but I want to approach this from an engineering perspective. Or maybe I just love the visual astronomy. And from the visual astronomy, I can think about it in terms of the ancient days. I can think about it in terms of what I'm actually seeing and try to work out the astrophysics and where these objects come from and what their story is. Or I can combine the two and even maybe discover something completely new. So when we try to figure out what paths are available to us if we have an interest in space, first place we go to is NASA or the Canadian Space Agency or the European Space Agency, and we look at the different fields. And Dr. Ahrens did a wonderful job the other, uh, this was actually back in the fall in one of the Global Star Parties, talking about how interdisciplinary science has become in the space sciences field. And it's the same way within engineering. There's not just mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering that can take you into space exploration, but we have people from geology backgrounds, geophysics, robotic engineering, space engineering, systems design, software. All of them can have careers in space. But let's face it, a lot of students that come to my course and a lot of people that come out to our outreach events or our public events or watch the Global Star Parties or watch the Astronomical League live, this is an interest area. This is a hobby, but this is not the career that they're looking towards. Maybe they'll end up in a career in human resources or finance where they can get a job within the space industry and they'll enjoy it. They'll love it. But for a lot of people, they don't have the content expertise, nor do they want to develop the content expertise. But And yet, the idea of being part of space science is a motivation. It's a driving factor. And that's why early on in my course and early on in our outreach, we introduce youth to the idea of citizen science. The idea that even as a member of the general public, even without content expertise, you can participate in space exploration, in astronomy, in astrophysics research. So what is citizen science? And why am I bringing it to you here at the Astronomical League Live? Why do I wanna share this message to the world? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first is that this idea of citizen science is participating in active science, but by the general public with no expected expertise in any particular area. Now, sometimes it's done as a collaborative project with professional scientists, but sometimes it's not. 
when I talk to a lot of educators about citizen science, there's not just one flavor. And I was able to identify what I think are the three distinct types of citizen science that I explore with my students. The first is very similar to what we do in post-secondary classrooms and labs. It's your typical lab in a physics you know, course is you go in and you rep reproduce some historical measurement or some experiment to try to verify that yes, the acceleration due to gravity is constant with mass and it works out to roughly 9.81 meters per second squared and it appears to be pointing towards the center of the earth. It's trying to reproduce the observations or the measurements that match the way in which we're learning material within a classroom or within a talk, for example. The second is to access real data and use the data to learn some research and analysis techniques. And this is often done at the post-secondary level going into the graduate school level as a way for people to develop the skills they're going to need if they're going to become research leads themselves. That can be citizen science if it's done in a way where you're leaving the collection to those who are experts, but you're learning the analysis techniques that come from a multidisciplinary perspective or from multiple backgrounds. And then the third is what most people refer to as citizen science, which is analyzing current scientific data or images to assist ongoing research projects. So there you're directly contributing to the advancement of scientific knowledge. So what I want to do over the next 20, 25 minutes is I'm going to walk you through all three of these with specific examples from my classes, as well as the outreach that we do at the RASC Montreal Center and at the RASC in general, and things that we've done in the Global Star Parties as well. So you, some of you that are act, avid members of the audience for the Global Star Parties will recognize a lot of the different aspects that I'm going to go through. But what I'm going to do at each point is I'm going to remind you that what we're talking about here is a way for people to come on board with astronomy, with understanding and analyzing astronomical data, regardless of the background that you have. So let's start with the reproducing historical observations. And you can go all the way back to ancient times, to observational uh, areas that were built by ancient cultures that may not even be there anymore, like Chanquillo in Peru where they have these dragon teeth basically on the side of a mountain that if you watch them throughout the year actually identify the rising points of the sun from the june solstice which in the southern hemisphere is when the sun is at its lowest altitude to the december solstice when it's at its highest altitude and this movement of the sun not just in terms of where it rises and how high it gets, but also where it rises along the horizon can be then reproduced using solography by taking pinhole camera images from anywhere on Earth. And you can identify this behavior of the movement of the sun and reproduce this type of uh, observation that was used in the early days to identify when different types of rituals needed to be done, whether it was for harvesting, whether it was for the most opportunity and the most likelihood of babies to survive when they're born because you have them at a certain time of year. So that's when you have your mating rituals or your marriage ceremonies. You can then take this idea of where the sun is at different times of the year and how high it gets to develop ways to tell time. And so the sky pillar by the Mi'kmaq is just basically a set of stones that are set along the north-south meridian so that where the sun falls in a shadow behind the pillars tells us exactly what time of year we're at. You can even do this from day to day with sundials and you can create your own sundials. And this is an activity that we often do with young elementary school age kids. Now, if you make a sundial with stone and you hammer it into the ground, it's a little bit hard to do, you know, daylight savings time. But other than that, it's a really good exercise to show the way in which the day changes hours based on where the sun's shadow is. And then when you get to post-secondary level, you can move on and make that even deeper because you can start to understand why the sun rises at different points based on the tilt of the earth and where we are within our orbit around the sun. And you can start to access astronomical databases like timeanddate.com. And you can graph out 
the altitude of the sun or the number of hours of sunlight and you can figure out everything from the tilt of the Earth's axis to the latitude from which you're actually observing this behavior. You can go out at night and you can take a long exposure of the night sky, or you can take discrete pictures over a long period of time and make them into a time-lapse video. And if you compile them all into one picture, you get a star trail. And the length of arc of that star trail allows you to determine the length of the day because we know that the stars around the North Pole, because of the rotation of the Earth, would have to complete a full circle in 24 hours. And so we're able to determine that stars move 15 degrees per hour. And so our duration tells us the size of the arc that we should see from the, side, from the sidereal trails. And then you can do really interesting things like what Dr. Barth talked about in this week's Global Star Party, which is try to measure the latitude and the curvature of the Earth and even the circumference of the Earth using the Eratosthenes experiment and trying to see a shadow at a specific place at a specific moment in time. Solar noon on the summer solstice was when Eratosthenes did it, but the global experiment is to actually measure that shadow during the equinox. And this is done through a amazing global uh, uh, project and my students get to take part in this. They take their data and it's a pretty straightforward experiment for post-secondary students, but what's wonderful for them is they get to con contribute to the citizen science aspect by sharing their data with schools at the same longitude. So they share it with an elementary school in Florida, with an elementary school in Colombia, and with a high school in Argentina. And so they send their measurements in all of these different schools that are along close to the same longitude that took the measurement at almost the same time can use the difference in the shadow length to figure out the circumference of the Earth. And so they're contributing not just to their own knowledge by reproducing this historical measurement, but also to the knowledge being learned and built by younger children that they don't have direct access to, but that they can help. Then you can bring them out into the night sky. And this requires actual observation of the night sky to try to reproduce Galileo's observations of the Galilean moons around Jupiter. And you can go out yourself and take pictures at different times of the day of the night for many, many nights in a row. Or you can take a computer simulation and try to see what it would look like through a telescope and graph out the position of these different moons. And when you do that, you can determine the mass of Jupiter using simple relationships. Now, it's one thing to do this as a classroom exercise and try to reproduce Kepler's laws and try to understand that what you know from universal gravitation from your high school days and from your post-secondary classes matches what you're seeing here. But it's another thing to come out at night, look through a telescope, and see the stripes on the planet's surface and these little points of light that are moons around another planet and see them change position through the night. One of my first students in astronomy, Aaron, he wrote because he was taking a double deck degree, so it's a double degree in social science and science, and he had a class on Western civilizations. They were discussing the scientific revolution and they were discussing about Galileo. And he came out to an astronomy night, saw the Galilean moons, saw them move through the night, and went back into class and described the whole process to all the students. So the observation that he made became an impactful way for everyone to have that learning experience together moving forward. Now, once you get them looking up, now you can actually start contributing into astronomy. Remember, that was that last part of citizen science. If you just get them looking up, one of the contributions they can make from early on, and I have my students do this the second week of school, they go out and they take globe at night observations. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to quantify the reality of light pollution. And here in Montreal, that's a big problem. Once they start to understand that the night sky that we see is heavily impacted by the artificial lights around us, we can start to explore what that means to the astronomical data that we're going to be looking at further on in the course. And so one of the ways to do that is to just take a very nice night sky target like the Andromeda Galaxy, 
and try to draw out details from one of these DSLR 20 second images that a lot of us go out and take at night because this is a really great starting point where you don't even need a tracker to get some detail out of Andromeda. And as they try to draw out that detail in the neighboring galaxy that's coming towards us, what they find is that there is an incredible amount of instrument noise, of random noise, of optical defects and light pollution within the picture. And so you start to teach them the techniques that are used. Remember, that's the second part of citizen science is learning some of the techniques that can be used, but you don't need to understand where the thermal noise comes from to understand how to try to compensate for it. Those are specific techniques that you can start to share with them. And as they learn those techniques, if their interest goes in that direction, they'll want to know more why, how, how does this work? Why does this, why do I have to take the same duration of a flat as I have to do for the light subs? Why can't I just take a single flat? Why do I have to take many of them? Why do I take multiple hours of integration time to get as much detail as possible? They can start to dive into that if the actual photographic process is of interest to them. If not, these simple techniques still allow them to start to dive in and see some of the details in galaxies, see the spiral arms in the dust, see other galaxies around Andromeda. And you start to look at other top, other objects, other targets that you want to look at over the night that you're going to be talking about in your outreach or that they may have heard about. And so Sometimes, especially for us here in Montreal with the bad weather nights, it's hard to get out and take the data yourself. And so robotic telescopes are incredibly useful. And at the moment, the RASC has access to one that we own in the Sierra Mountains of California. And using that, you can take a nice little picture of the Andromeda Nebula. And it's very similar to the first picture of the Andromeda Nebula that most of us will take. But learning how to take from this and pull out all the wonderful detail that's in the Andromeda Nebula is something that can be done even by elementary school kids. Because you can take a free software like GIMP and you can open up each of the files for a red filtered image, a green filtered image, and a blue filtered image and start to pull out the details simply by understanding that the histogram is showing you all of the photons that are available compressed in this original picture compressed into the amount of black that you see there taking most of the actual histogram. So if you're able to use the software and you can show them step by step by step and work through it with them to pull out the details, they start to see the nebulosity. And then you talk to them about the choices they have in analyzing these types of images real astronomical data, you're left with a choice because it's the same photons on the left or the right. What's different is how much you increase the exposure level and how much contrast you want to set. And this is where the subjectivity can come into this. So some students will come out with the entire core blown out completely. You can't see the trapezium at all, but the colors are vibrant and you can see so much nebulosity, while others will be very, very careful to take at least one or two of those filtered images and try to maintain the structure of the core, even at the expense of the colors and the different densities that you could see in the nebulosity of that little lobster claw under the, ne the nebula core. These same students, can then choose to move further in this project. And here's where the citizen science aspect comes in because everybody's doing the Orion Nebula, everybody's looking at the processes. In class, we're studying about the birth of stars and the birth of planetary systems. And then they can go out and start examining their own nebulae. So the Eagle Nebula, you can take different grayscale images and then you can combine them. And once you process them, you can start to see how much detail you can see in other nebulae that are available to you from these robotic telescopes. You can also start to determine different processing techniques. You can use layers versus compose and see if you can draw out different details by instead of every single filter being the same weight, 
you can change the transparency of different filters to identify the features, the scientific processes that you find of interest there. You can also start bringing narrowband data in, and you can start using international collaborations like the LCO, the Las Cambras Observatory, or the wonderful uh, Liverpool telescope run by the National Schools Observatory, and you can start to even look at southern hemisphere objects which you can't see with your own eyes, but identify and explore targets where you know that there's a physics that you can't see for yourself. Now, there's a reason why I'm sharing this astrophotography approach with you under the umbrella of citizen science, and it's because of a project that I have ongoing this term. I have a student, Julian Adelstein, who's working with me in the independent research course, and what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to explore the James Webb Space Telescope data files. So identifying how to look at infrared images that you can't see with your own visual eyes, taking those same types of approaches of pulling out details with different filtered wavelengths that can pierce through dust and really enhance the core of, for example, here the Southern Ring Nebula allows you to reproduce some of these incredible images that were published by the James Webb Space Telescope early on, and the amount of data that is coming in there is nonstop. So if you learn these techniques at a very basic level, just with GIMP, you can apply them to cutting edge data that's been taken within the last year and explore objects which we've never been able to see in this way before. In order to show the students early on that this is a, something that they're able to do, that they're able to participate directly in scientific research, I spent some time with them on JunoCam. JunoCam is the public camera that was placed on the Juno probe as it was sent out towards Jupiter. And what the students see is that they have these slices of images that the Juno probe takes as it approaches Jupiter for any pass, a perijove, as it comes to its closest pass by Jupiter. They have, just like we do for the Orion Nebula using the RAS Robotic Telescope, they have red, green, and blue filters. And then they learn that science isn't always easy. And the reason is because the Juno camera has a bias towards the yellow-brown. And so if you take the RGB and you simply do the same composed process that we did for the Orion Nebula, you actually get a very ugly yellowy brown mess. There's a couple of reasons for that. First off, the original instrument already had a bias to it. Then it's exposed to intense solar radiation with no atmosphere and no shell around it to protect it all the time. And then it passes through Jupiter's strong magnetic field constantly. So the JPL scientists are constantly adjusting how much of a bias there is between the red, the green, and the blue, and for these amazing public images that they let available from the moment the perijo finishes, they create a color composite mask. So if the color composite mapped image that they put out is available with the proper balance of RGB for wherever the camera is for its sensitivity during that perijo, the students can use other tools like curves instead of levels to pull out detail on Jupiter's surface. They can pull out cloud structure. And when I have them do this as a group, you know, they're going to want to look at the great red spot. They're going to want to see all the different transitions in the storm and what details they can draw out. And again, there's a subjectivity there. But if you get them to look at an entire surface, they have obtain different results than if you get them to focus in on one specific storm, one specific cloud layer, one specific boundary between the ammonia and the nitrous gases, the, between the, la the layers of low pressure and high pressure that create the banded structure on Jupiter. All of these images are then able to be, if the student wants to, contributed back to the JunoCam Public Images Gallery. And one of the things that really just always touches me, it hits home, is when I go to the JunoCam Image Gallery and I see the handles of a couple of former students that still are going back every new Perijove and playing around 
and every few months, they'll toss one up because they really like the way it looks. Because once you're a part of the JudoCam community, you can help point out features, details that you're seeing that can then direct where scientists spend their time analyzing the data coming from JunoCam. Because one of the big things that we've recognized with these solar system probes, and not just JunoCam, all of the probes that NASA, ESA, and the international collaborations have put out, there's more data coming than can possibly be analyzed by single scientist groups, research groups, even grad students from across the world. There's just too much data to work with it. Last weekend, I met a student that was there for one of the Gaia releases, and she was saying that she's hoping to run an event next summer to teach people how to play around with the Gaia data and try to pull out some, if there's any anomalies or anything that gives you proper motion of the stars to add that to the data being analyzed by research groups working with the Gaia satellite directly. Because there's just, it's 1 billion stars worth of data at a time that they're releasing. There's just too much there for the scientists themselves to work through on their own. On top of that, you can have the ability using these remote telescopes, using backyard telescopes to take discrete images of stars over the span of an entire night. And using a database like the Swarthmore database, you can determine that there's a exoplanet transit happening during the time you're looking. And when an exoplanet transit happens, a planet around a extrasolar system passes between us and the star, causing the starlight to dip shortly. That dip allows you to determine the size, the relative radi radius of that planet versus the star that it's passing in front of. And in order to do so, you have to actually plot out the intensity of light, not just from that star, but from all the reference stars. And the reason why you have to do it from all the reference stars is because you have to identify if the dip is due to a planet passing or potentially just a cloud passing in front of your field of view. Now, why is this citizen science if we already know that hat P16b is an exoplanet with this exact period? It's because there's a series of possible exoplanets. They're called test objects of interest, which we have yet to absolutely confirm as exoplanets. If you're out taking shots of, a night, of the night sky for a few hours every night, and you decide you want to be part of this, you can choose an area where there's a star with a possible exoplanet with enough magnitude of light that you can detect it and see the variations yourself with your camera setup with your telescope. And so there's a lot of students and a lot of amateur astronomers that do this now. They go out at night, they pick out an area of the sky, and after they do their own imaging for the target they want to do, they set up their star tracker to stay on that area of the sky for the amount of time that that possible exoplanet is expected to transit. And then if you see the depth of curve and a clear delineation like what you saw for the known exoplanet, then you can submit it to, to Swarthmore, to NASA, to JPL, and say, I believe that this is an actual exoplanet. Here's my data file. And the software you use for this is freeware, just like GIMP is. This is Astro Image J that we're using for this. Now, these are some of the projects that my students get to do for their major project where they get to really dive into real astronomical research. But not all of them care about imaging. Not all of them care about quantifying relationships. Some of them really have a bend towards space exploration from a biological perspective, from the health of astronauts or from biological systems in space. And so for those, I've developed a collaboration with Orion's Quest. And Orion's Quest is available for any teacher who's interested in sharing biological research aboard the ISS with their students. Not only do they have modules that you can have students continue and, and complete on site on their website. But for some of their projects, for some of their research, they actually have 
kits that you can bring into your classroom and grow microbes, grow worms, grow crystals, and compare what you grow in gravity to what they grow in microgravity aboard the ISS. Now, these are fascinating projects for the students who want to dive into these areas. And sometimes I'm jealous with the amount of time they get to spend on these projects because it's, it's wonderful to see them dive in and go as far as they want, whether it's Orion's Quest, whether it's the exoplanet transits, whether it's imaging, whether it's accessing solar system probes, whether it's the spectroscopy that we talked about at the very start. But what about the students who, when they leave, are never going to look at space again. They're never going to be part of an astronomy club. They're never going to take another astronomy course. But they still want to contribute in some way to science, to the research being done, because that's something that would give them the idea that they really are participatory in science today. And that's where I love Zooniverse. And so Zooniverse is a wonderful project-based system that started with this thing called Galaxy Zoo. So I have all of my students in one of their activities have the opportunity to explore Galaxy Zoo. And what Galaxy Zoo is, is they show you a picture of a galaxy. And they explain to you what an elliptical galaxy looks like, what a spiral galaxy looks like, what a barred spiral galaxy looks like, the different flavors and categories of all these different types of galaxies. If you have a lenticular galaxy that's kind of elliptical and kind of spiral, but we're not quite sure what it is. And then they show you these images taken by astronomers through remote telescopes, through space telescopes of galaxies that have yet to have a permanent identification because nobody's had time to really sit down and figure out what type of galaxy these are. And they ask you to categorize the galaxy. Is this a spiral? Is it a barred spiral? How many arms does it have? Is it interacting with anything else? Now this has a couple of different purposes behind it. First is for the actual categorization. But second is if we get enough people from various different backgrounds, even with no prior knowledge whatsoever about what galaxies look like. The human eye discerns detail differently from computers. If you can identify the average um, categorization given to a galaxy and how much deviation there is, you can start to train artificial intelligence to do these types of steps for you. But there's other things that artificial intelligence can't do that are required and that are really of amazing interest. One of those is star notes, where the Harvard computers, the women who did the early work on astronomical spectra, their notes are still to be transcribed and digitized, and they're starting to fall apart. And so there's an entire project on Zooniverse that a lot of my students who have a social science background or have an interest in going into law or into medicine or into completely different fields, once every month or two, they've got a free night. They'll sit down, they'll log in, and they'll start transcribing notes. And they'll transcribe those notes and put them in. And there's multiple transcriptions done for every set of notes so that if there's any bias to the way you're reading certain curved uh, letters, certain shorthand, it can be weeded out because the idea here is to contribute to the historical re recording of these incredible scientists that we had early on. And then the students who really enjoy parts of Zooniverse sometimes write up on it. And then Sky News, their Canadian magazine on astronomy and stargazing, actually has published two of my students, one who did a project on gravitational waves and the ripples in space time, and the other who did a project on the second iteration of Galaxy Zoo, which is Radio Galaxy Zoo, which was trying to identify strong radio signals, which typically portend active gal galactic nuclei at the center of some of these massive galaxies. And those are areas of study right now, especially now that we've started taking images of black holes themselves, such as in M87 where if you can determine the amount of energy coming out of some of these areas, you can figure out, for example, the amount of angular momentum and the rough size that that black hole might have, so that you have an idea of the angular resolution you need if you want to try to take a picture of that black hole with the Event Horizon Telescope. So all in all, with the students and with the outreach that we provide, what we try to do is we try to provide different points 
where students with different interest areas, different backgrounds, different ideas of where they want the career to take them can join in to scientific research in space sciences, regardless of their background, and continue on in those areas if they have an interest in it. And so I highly encourage anybody here who hasn't been to Zooniverse to go to Zooniverse. Anybody who hasn't tried to do an exoplanet transit curve, do so. Anybody who's taken a picture of the night sky and wants to try to process it, download GIMP, start playing around with it, pull out detail. You'll be surprised at how much you can learn about these astronomical bodies. And then once you've done that, go on to the MAST, to the James Webb Space Telescope data, to the old Hubble data, even to the Spitzer data, Chandra data, it's all publicly accessible. And anything you do that you want to share, somebody out there will be able to use to either solidify their conclusions or question the direction they thought they were taking in understanding those objects in space. Terry, back to you. Wow, that is amazing. You know, I have not heard so many different projects brought up by anybody. That is incredible. I, I can't imagine <laughs> how lucky students are these days. Uh, you know, it is such a great time to be involved in astronomy for everything that is coming out and everything that's available to people. I mean, whether you're a student or even an adult, you know, retirees or somebody that's looking for something to do. This is an incredible opportunity, I think. So I'll be quiet and see if there's any questions anywhere. Well, I did want to mention that, you know, our local club, they provide these image files for the students to explore any target they want to. We have a retired couple that started around the same I did, uh, same time I did in Rask, Montreal, and they will bring me USB keys and drop it off in my mailbox if students ask for a target that I don't have so that I don't have to go looking for it from a remote telescope because they have all the calibration curves, they have the exact equipment they use, they have the exact field of view that they use. And so the students can then go out for one of the observing nights and talk to them and they'll sit there and stack it in real time and show them, look, look, this is what we... it, it's, it's wonderful because it brings the students into the club it brings the youth into the club. And when we do electronically assisted astronomy, which now after COVID is a reality for almost everyone, when you do that in an outreach event and you can pop on one of those spectral filters and show them Albireo where the rainbows are different for the yellow and the blue star, their jaws drop. It's incredible. I bet. I, I cannot imagine. I mean, it is. It's incredible. Thank you so much. Now, I'll, I'll go back. If anybody, does anyone have any questions or are there any questions, Scott? Uh, no questions, just a uh, basic, um, not basic, but, you know, <laughs> accolades for Kareem's presentation here uh, from Hera Locke, uh, from myself um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Norm Hughes and everybody that's watching right now. Uh, you know, it's just great to hear. Um, you know, Kareem's presentations, you really bring uh, such a great enthusiasm and, you know, as I say, joy uh, in teaching. Um, and so we just love it. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Does anybody uh, in the presenters have any questions anywhere? All right. Well, Kareem, that, ah, huh. That was, I'm amazed. I am so glad this is recorded where people can watch it at a later date. Uh, this is amazing. Thank you so much My for My being on the show. We'll have you come back anytime you'd like to come back. <laughs> I will be talking to you more, I'm sure. But thank you. I, I really, I'm sure, as everybody else did, have thoroughly enjoyed that. My so, pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very much. So with that, um, I would like to bring up AL Live will not be here next month. I am going to be traveling and we are going to not have a program in March. But on April 28th, we have Michael Bockage coming on to mm -hmm. talk about the 2024 solar eclipse. So mark your calendars for that. It will be an amazing program, amazing talk. Um, he was at Alcon in Albuquerque and the room was packed. He brings a lot. He, it's time to start gearing up. We're all going to start gearing up for the 2024. We need to prepare. We need to figure out a lot of stuff, well, equipment, where we're going. 
Michael will have a lot of these questions answered or give you a lot of ideas. So please join us April 28th. Michael Bockage will be our keynote that night. And I think with that, that is all I have. So Scott, I want to turn it back over to you. And thank, first, I want to thank everybody. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you to everybody out there viewing. We're so glad you're there and we are having such a good time being here. So please join us again, April 28th. And thank you to everybody. And Scott, I will turn this back over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be with uh, the Astronomical League and, uh, you know, it's distinguished speakers, uh, presenters, uh, and friends that are here on this program, including our audience. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, share this uh, with people that you think uh, could benefit from the knowledge of uh, student science, citizen science, um, or the just flat out the inspiration of, of Kareem Jaffer. So, and David Levy and Terry Mann and Carol Orge <laughs> and John Goss is already signed off by the way. But um, uh, anyhow, uh, we'll be back um, not next week. Uh, we have a Valentine's Day um, holiday next week, uh, but uh, the week after I believe we'll have another global star party. So. Uh, that would also include the Astronomical League. So thank you, and uh, you guys have a great night, and uh, keep looking up. Thank you.